Hello and welcome future dolphins. Congratulations on your recent admission to our school. My name is Ruby and I am a current third year student here at CSU Channel Islands. Today we will be highlighting the anthropology program and here with us today we have Dr. Colleen Delaney, program chair and professor in the anthropology program here at CSU Channel Islands. Hello Dr. Delaney, how are you? Great, thanks Ruby. Nice Great. to meet everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we get started, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about the anthropology program. Um, yep, so I'm the chair of anthropology. Um, our major wasn't opened until 2012, and this year we separated from sociology, although we don't have any overlapping classes, we would share faculty. So we are a relatively small program at CI, but that's what makes us special because we actually know our students and for, when I see things such as internships coming across my desk, I can think of actually specific students that I want to send that to. So we believe in a holistic approach to anthropology. So we want students to be as educated as possible across the four fields, and then they can pick and choose classes depending on what they want to do. Yeah, super awesome. Um, so one of my first questions is, what are the most popular courses, um, maybe minors or other options within the major that a student can declare for anthropology? Again, since we're kind of new, we don't have any separate tracks at this point. It's just it's, we have a minor, which requires some lower division, you know, a couple of required classes, and then you get to choose. And then we have the major. It's, we have a relatively low unit major. We only require about 42 to 43 units. And we do that intentionally because we want students to then branch out depending on what they're really interested in so they could focus more. So if you're interested in biological anthropology, you might want to take a few extra chemistry classes if you're interested in um, bone chemistry. So isotope analysis, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward major. Um, we give students the time to, to pick and choose what they want. And then we want you to explore within the major. So even though you might think you're an archaeology student, we also want students to then take some of the sociocultural classes, things like that. So it's really hard to say what is our you know, most popular classes because it really depends on the student's interests. Uh, but altered states of consciousness is a, is a favorite class. Um, human ecology, which is cross-listed with environmental science and resource management, that's popular. Um, medical anthropology, again, so because you can apply bioanthropology as well as cultural at, in those things. So it really, really depends on the students. Some students really like the hands-on stuff. So our archaeology classes, such as experimental archaeology, where you actually get to learn to make things using um, technologies that um, indigenous peoples use to really get you to think about, well, why are they making the decisions? Why did they live that way? And right, it's, it's easier to understand when you actually have to make things the way they did. Um, yeah, actually, from my experience, I can say I'm probably taking all of those most popular courses. So, and I think one of my favorites is probably human ecology, um, you know, going out and actually going to the Santa Rosa Island with one of the professors. I was so amazed that we were actually able to apply that knowledge to the field. It was such a cool experience. I, I really couldn't believe that I would be able to do something like that. Right. And, and that's what our pride also in, is we try to get every student out to the islands. Unfortunately, right, with COVID-19, that was put on hold the past year. But um, we want every student to get out there at least once. And we have classes. Um, and it might look a little pricey. You say, oh, that's a course fee of $150. But that's to help pay for the trip out to the island. And then you won't have any other books for that class. So um, applied, um, sorry, yeah, applied anthropology, archaeological method and theory, human ecology, my seacoast class. Native Californians, those are all classes that have taken trips out to the islands because we want students to go out there. And so some of those have just been weekend trips where you kind of soak it in and others such as archeological method and theory and applied anthropology, we're actually doing projects for the National Park Service. So that's the other key component of anthropology is we really believe in hands-on learning and service learning. So helping out um, different groups again, such as the state parks or national parks, um, you know, do projects that help train students, but also help them out as well. Since for example, Channel Islands National Park has one archeologist and one cultural resource manager. That's it for all five islands. So they need all the help they can get. Yeah. How amazing. Um, let's see, my second question is, is there any type of academic background that a student should have to enter the major? Again, no, because we are the most diverse of the, or you know, most, or maybe you'd say most general uh, of the social sciences. So it really depends on your field. So if you're interested in archaeology, so I'm an archaeologist technically by training. So 
you really want some hands-on classes, but maybe GIS, maybe geology, um, biology folks also might want to take some uh, biological anthro, might want to take some biology or chemistry, as I said. Sociocultural folks maybe also want to dabble in communication. Um, you know, so it really depends on, on your focus because we want to give you guys the freedom to take the classes that really help push that. But we also don't want students to focus too early. There are some students who say, oh, I'm only an archaeologist. That's all I'm ever going to take. But, you know, you take that medical anthropology class or you take that oral history class and that actually might stimulate some new questions that will actually help you in that other quote, you know, subfield that you're really focused, that you think you're focused in on. So at this point, we really want students to be a generalist if they can overall, but then feel free to explore that particular subfield that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Um, my third question, what are the opportunities to participate in hands-on learning in the major? So we've already gone over some of that, but I can't you know, say it enough. So we've had students intern with um, National Park Service, uh, with state parks at the Shumash Museum in Westlake Village, a couple of the adobes, um, the Maritime Museum. Um, I've been actually working hard to try to get a student at the CB Museum in Port Wyneme because that's one that actually can be a sociocultural student, right? Because the CB's brought back all this material culture from Melanesia and Polynesia during World War II. So that's a, an example of an internship that isn't archaeology. It's one that's actually sociocultural where you're applying it. So most of our internships have been more of the history or archaeology type, but that's partially just due to the type of students. Um, so I really want to encourage other students to you can intern elsewhere, just you have to talk to us and say, hey, I'm really interested in you know, X. Um, but also it doesn't have to be an internship. So um, anthropology has a capstone, all students have to take it. And you're, you can do a quote, independent research project or do something more applied. And when I had one student in my applied anthropology class because I had a guest speaker from actually the Guitar Center uh, who was an anthropologist and the student went, what? I can study where I work? And at California Pizza Kitchen, she talked to the heads up, the, you know, the head people. She got permission to interview every single uh, front house employee. So the bus staff and the wait staff across the country about what is California culture, because that's what California Pizza, Ki Pizza Kitchen sells. And then she got to interview 12 out of 40 administrators because their headquarters are down in Playa del Rey in Los Angeles. And so, and then after that, they hired her to rewrite the entire handbook for all of California Pizza Kitchen. So, you know, and she's since left California Pizza Kitchen because she graduated about 10 years ago now, but, but she's moved on to Coffee Bean and the Santa Barbara Zoo. So her hope, you know, the whole point is you use anthropology to help you in your everyday job, whatever it may be. So most folks aren't quote anthropologist after their title, but you're actually an anthropologist in your job. So in this case, California Pizza Kitchen, it's all about how people interact with each other in order to better serve them. Um, and so that's why I say anthropology is really wide open and what you can do with it as you will. Um, we had one student a few years ago, his goal was to start his own clothing company. And so he wanted to be an anthropologist actually to help with marketing. So he could understand what are the forces that drive people? Why are they interested in certain things? Um, and he wanted to be, you know, more sustainable, create a more sustainable brand. So also the environmental aspect to it. So um, and lots of hands-on um, activities. So whether it's service learning, um, we have the forensic anthropology class where you actually go out and learn how to do forensic um, anthropology. I've had students train them in archaeology. So then they can actually go out and work for cultural resource management firms even before they graduate. Um, my very first major, even though we weren't actually officially a major yet, you know, first day after graduation, she was actually working for an archaeology firm um, on campus, actually on a project. So uh, really the sky's the limit. We want folks to um, create um, and don't just, you know, wait for a professor, you know, also think about yourself. Okay, what do I want to do? What are my goals? And how can I get there? Because your faculty are, are, the faculty are there for you. And again, because we're a small program, um, and even though we don't have a lot of like a bioanthropologist a tenure track, we actually have, I think, five students that are in graduate school right now for bioanthropology. And that's partially due to our lecturer uh, staff. So even though even our lecturer folks who don't work all the time, you know, full time, they're actually fully dedicated in with our students and really want to help them uh, thrive. Um, so, yeah, the sky's the limit for internships and work experiences. It's just you have to come talk to us and help us yeah. guide you. It's really just that holistic approach, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you kind of already actually already answered my next question was what type <laughs> of jobs do graduates see upon graduation? I'm, I know you mentioned California Pizza Kitchen um, and just like the different studies that people people can do. Is there anything else um, that you um, see? Yeah, no, we've had students go on to the Peace Corps. Um, actually, I had one student who, looking back at her, when she applied, I was looking at my notes, She her goal was to work for a nonprofit but after graduation, which I thought was great as a high school student. She actually worked for the Red Cross. She just got her master's in emergency management. And now, thanks to COVID, she's working at Cal State Fullerton um, in emergency management. And we've had numerous students go on for um, student affairs type work, so getting their master's degree. Um, I have one student who got her master's in public health and is actually now working on her PhD in public health. So again, um, we allow you guys to learn about humans and then you just have to delve, you know, create your own path. Mm -hmm. and realize that whatever you're doing, you know, there's those careers. So we have the standard folks doing, um, you know, graduate school, but then you have other folks who are going on working for health departments and uh, Red Cross. There's a whole field of anthropology called applied anthropology. And those are for the folks who don't actually have a professor's job or a museum job, but you're actually going out and doing things. And two of my sisters actually, um, at least joke is it, is it nature or nurture, uh, but are, are applied anthropologists. So they travel around the world working for um, nonprofits or for small organizations or countries to help them. So one of my students, um, my sorry, student sisters has a project in Malawi, which is the poorest country probably in the world, right? One of the poorest um, where, you know, only 10% of the population has electricity. So she was hired along with some other um, social scientists to try to really figure out how can they best serve the people. And so they went around interviewing people, talked to people and the, the locals said, you know what? We can't all have electricity, but please let's have electricity in a community center and the school. And then everybody can go there, right, when they need to. So again, this is the kind of things that anthropologists do. So even though, and sometimes it's hard to kind of convince employers because they're like, what is anthropology? So you might have to do a little bit of education. Um, but the point is anthropologists can do just about anything, right? Because the whole point is understanding people, respecting people's beliefs um, and, their, and understanding their backgrounds. And that will help you, right, interact and gather material and anything. So, so really the sky truly is the limit, I hate to say that. But there are the plenty of us like me who go on to become college professors, right? And do have more what, traditional roles. So I just, I like this field because it really lets you do what you want and it allows you to actually, you can change midstream. So the same sister who works in Malawi was a college professor for a while, but she decided, you know what? I'd rather do hands-on work. Or my identical twin sister, who's an applied anthropologist, she does fisheries management. So her job is to work with the ecologists to say, hey, you know, we don't want the fish to go extinct. We also don't want the small scale fishermen who rely on that fish for their livelihoods to go extinct. We want their, they're able to continue that livelihood. And she actually testified to the national government in Ireland to try to give small scale fishermen the same rights as you see indigenous peoples elsewhere, because that is their job. So again, the point is be flexible, right? And you never know where it's gonna lead you. Mm -hmm. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, my next question, how does your program prepare students for graduate school? Um, we actually think we do a pretty good job. Um, again, small major, so we don't have, you know, as, as many students going on to graduate school. But as I've said, we've had students go around the world. I mean, currently we have students at Berkeley, UCSB, uh, Fullerton, uh, Kent, uh, Leiden, and Australia National University. So just a few. So the whole point is, you know, go where you can. But I think the best thing that we do is we give the hands-on training to help you explore, um, give you exposure to a variety of experiences, and we have our capstone, which I don't know, Ruby might agree or disagree whether or not you're afraid of it coming up. A lot of students are afraid of it because they're like, I don't want to go to graduate school. Um, but the point is for the capstone, it'll help you even if you don't go to graduate school. But if you go to graduate school, it's a definite help because it gives you a writing sample right, to show. So the whole point of the capstone it's two semesters, is that you pick a project that you're interested in. So we've had some students look at, you know, linguistics or the world of Warcraft. They've looked at how um, atheists versus theists do with health, you know, with um, healing, whether or not you believe in a higher force that will help your healing. Um, we've had students do look at graffiti, recording graffiti out on the islands before it, you know, gets washed away due to storms and things like that. So you, you get to pick your topic. You have to design the project. Um, do the literature review, and there's always a faculty member there to help you along the way. And if you work with living people, you have to do what's called human subjects. So you have to, you know, 
make sure everybody understands what the project is for. And then the second semester, you actually gather your data and you know, so you interview people or you record your artifacts and then you analyze your artifacts and your, your material and you write up your paper. It's about 40 pages. Don't believe me, that's not much. A lot of students go oh, 40 pages, but you know, when you do all that, line it out, it's easy. And then everybody has to present it at our student research forum. Um, but we've had, especially archeology span students, they've also presented at national and regional conferences. So the point is after this whole two semester project, you have then gotten valuable you know, employment and job skills. You know how to identify a problem, you know how to do the research um, and get the information that's needed. And then you interpret it and figure out how to solve that problem. So that's definitely gonna help you for graduate school because voila, you've already got your writing sample, which is usually required, or you can talk about that. But even if you're not going on to graduate school and you're not sure, you then have the skill that's gonna help you in whatever you do in the future. So um, we're able to do this type of capstone because we are so small. So the larger programs that have hundreds of majors, they can't quite do that. But because this is a benefit for us for, for being such a small program um, is that we can actually really focus on students and help you dig deep into that topic. Mm -hmm. How 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 big is your um, the capstone class this year? Do you know? Oh, uh, you know, thanks to COVID, we've had you know some students have had to take time off. I think the capstone class right now is only seventeen students, fifteen wow. seventeen students. Our largest class ever thus far has been twenty four. So again, we're still relatively small, um, and so we can give you guys the the hands on experience. And there's funding on campus for students to gather their, you know, to go either to conferences or, or use materials. I've had students analyze the nutritional value of plants that were important for the shoe mash. And so we got money for her to actually, you know, use the, the chemical, the whatever, you know, I don't, I'm not a chemist. So whatever she needed to do for that, we were able to get funding for it. We've been able to send students uh, to conferences. I got funding for a student who was doing a historical project. So she needed access to historical newspapers. So she was able to, you know, I forget what it is, it was like $80 a year to get access to those databases, but we were able to fund that. So we don't want students to, you know, shy away from a project because they think it's, there's going to be money issues or other issues. Um, we want students to then, um, you know, do what they want. Like, you know, it's not always possible, but we most, most, you know, we work on it. Sorry. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Super cool. Fall. So, oh, so you'll probably be in it, Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm teaching Capstone or the pre Capstone and the Capstone next year. Yeah, that's me. Next class. <laughs> um, let's see. Another question. In your personal experience in your career in anthropology here at Channel Islands, what has been your favorite class to teach? Oh, you know, this is where I feel blasphemous as an archaeologist, but my absolute favorite class to teach is Introduction to Bioanthropology, the introduction. To, but it's basically human evolution because I get to cover archaeology in it. I cover, you know, we cover genetics, we cover ecology, we cover how people interact with each other. So it's really, I view it as for parts of it, it's anthropology in a nutshell, not quite as much cultural. But um, yeah, so that's, I've been, you know, I've taught at different universities, both on the tenure track and, and as a lecturer, and, and that still remains my, my favorite one. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Um, kind of one of my last questions, is there any general advice that you can offer a student who is just beginning their studies at Channel Islands? Just be curious. Be, um, a, a lot of students are like, oh, you know, mom and dad want me to be a business major. And I'm not, I'm not you know, um, bad mouthing business, but the point is they come in with a single track. They, they think uh, that's the way it has to be. And with a major like anthropology, the whole point is you wanna be curious, you wanna be flexible, um, you know, so it's like, hey, I got to fill that UD, you know, that upper division GE requirement in, in, um, in category D, I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance and I could do a, you know, a cultural class or sorry, communication that might spark an idea about a project you could do in anthropology because you did that. So, so take a chance, be flexible, be curious. And most importantly, I think, talk to your professors. I sit there in office hours, twiddling my thumbs because nobody comes to see me, but that's why you want to come to us. It's not just if you have a question about a class specifically. It's like, hey, you want to explore the field? You want to know about careers? Because as I said, it's we're a small program. And unfortunately, I don't think Ruby, I've, we haven't had a lot of contact. But there's sometimes where something comes across my desk and I'm like, that would be that would be really good for so-and-so. Um, and I can send them an email, right? Um, and help them, whether, whether it's an internship or a scholarship, right? Because we scholarships come across my desk for folks who are applying to graduate school. Um, yeah, so so regardless of your major, curious, flexibility, 
and talk to your professors. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, before we end, is there anything you'd like to add, Dr. Delaney? I think we've covered uh, all the main things, except for maybe if you're interested in anthropology and your parents, because this is what I hear a lot, they're like, but how will you make a living? <laughs> um, plenty of people have made livings with uh, anthro degrees. So there's famous um, uh, authors and you know chefs and you, you name it, or anthropologists. So again, it's um, most students don't end up doing something directly related to their major. So college is the time to explore and try new things. And then whatever, all that material and information you've learned, then you apply it to your life wherever, right, wherever it takes you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super cool. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Delaney. Students, if you have any more questions about the anthropology program, please visit um, our website. It's go.csuci.edu slash academics. Um, but thank you for coming to Admitted Dolphin Day and bye, and we'll hope you, we see you in the fall. <laughs>